quads and things that you have gathered over 20, 30 years. Tonight, dozens of homes are lost to wildfires on a Métis settlement in Alberta. This is enough reports that say it's emergency management's in a pretty bad place. Plus, as wildfires rage, one BC organization is training up Indigenous fire crews. I think she'll always, <laughs> always remember it. It was, yeah, something really cool. And a pint-sized fan hits the big stage at a Shania Twain concert. Good evening, Tanse Anin. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Zach Whitecloud of the Vegas Golden Knights should be getting media attention for his play on the ice. After all, he scored a goal in Game 3 of their second-round matchup against the Edmonton Oilers. But it's comments about his last name that have all the attention. On Monday night, ESPN Sports Center anchor John Anderson compared Whitecloud's name to toilet paper. Now, Anderson is walking back those comments, admitting that he blew it. White Cloud hails from the Sioux Valley Dakota Nation in Manitoba. The nation says White Cloud is a source of pride for the community, and the incident can serve as a learning lesson. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs echoed those remarks, saying hockey brings us together, yet racism and discrimination continue at all levels. White Cloud addressed the comments in an emotional conversation with reporters on Tuesday. I carry my grandfather's last name and I'm, nothing makes me more proud than to, to be able to do that. People make mistakes, right, and, and uh, it's just a time for everyone to learn. White Cloud says he and Anderson have spoken and that he accepts the broadcaster's apology. The Haida Nation and the province of British Columbia say they took a massive step towards reconciliation yesterday as a new bill recognizing the Haida government under provincial law was passed. ABTN's Lee Wilson reports. A delegation from the Haida Nation traveled from the north coast to Victoria to witness a historic day at the provincial legislature. Yesterday, the Haida Nation Recognition Act passed a third reading. Its supporters say it recognizes the rights of the Haida Nation under provincial law. Haida President Gagwis, Jason Alsop, says because of the past, they come to witness the day with mixed emotions. To here to celebrate, but here to also acknowledge the past and the, the work and the healing that we're doing together. BC Indigenous Relations Minister Murray Rankin said his government worked with the Haida Nation to craft the bill a job that spanned over two decades. Legislation, if approved by this House today, will be the first time in our history that the province would provide formal legal recognition of an Indigenous governing body outside the implementation of a modern treaty. The Haida Recognition Bill passed with cheers from the Legislative Assembly. It recognizes the Haida Nation's inherent rights to governance and self-determination outside of pre-confederation sovereignty. The Haida Nation say the bill was about good people on both sides working together. It is not to be feared, but to bring hope, that we can bring hope to each other, to others, to show an example that Indigenous title and rights to self-governance and self-determination and British Columbia and Canadian systems can find a way to interact and interface in a respectful way. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. A couple on the Quebec side of Aquasasne picked up Hydro-Quebec slack. They handed out generators to combat the frequent power outages in their community, which came in handy during the recent ice storm. Amelia Fournier has the story. It may be a beautiful day outside, but just this morning, Alexandra and Jason David's power went out. As you can see, uh, we don't put it away. Yeah. Just because you never know when the power is going to go out. Something that happens frequently on the Quebec side of Aguasasne. It is very frustrating when just right there across that tree line, they never lose power. And you can see it if you're driving around at night. Lights, everybody has lights and everybody's going about their business. But as soon as you hit this side of the road, it's darkness, it's quiet, it's eerie. Aguasazne's situation is particular. 
the community straddles the borders of the United States, Ontario and Quebec. While the cleanup from the aftermath of April's ice storm that hit Quebec and eastern Ontario is still underway, the Quebec side of Aguasasne, which is serviced by Hydro-Quebec, lost power for days. Luckily, some Aguasasne families were spared the worst of the outages using generators distributed by the Davids back in February. The last power outage we had, we got some really cute messages from some families like, thank you so much for the generator, you know, because we're able to use it today. And because of the faulty power, Aguasasne residents rely on generators, but not everyone can afford them. Nonprofit Save the Children Canada provided the Davids with funding, allowing them to hand out 15 generators based on highest need, one being a single mother with three young sons. When we brought that generator up to the porch, those little boys were jumping up and down and they were like, oh my God, a generator! You know, they were so excited. So even at that young age, they understand the fact that we don't have power a lot of the time over here in Quebec. So, um, and they know that it's a good thing for their family. We bought it for camp because there's no electricity at camp. It comes in more handy at our house where we live. But generators are an expensive, temporary solution, says Alexandra. In three days, you know, families are losing everything in their fridge. You know, even with generators, um, you don't always get to power everything that you need. The community's band council provides subsidies for spoiled food, something Hydro-Quebec has yet to do. They also provide warming centers and meals during long outages. Grand Chief Abram Benedict says the council has met with Hydro-Quebec several times to address the underlying causes. We do know that through the last power outage, uh, because it was so largely uh, affected a large area, that Quebec Hydro did admit that for financial purposes, they had not made those investments in pruning trees and as a result, you know, a very long uh, extended outage. In an email statement to APTN, Hydro-Quebec said that tree pruning should be finished in the next four to five weeks and infrastructure improvements finished by the end of this year. But for now, the community is a step closer to getting what they need to power through. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Aguasasne. The largest gathering of First Nations land guardians is happening in Ottawa this week. It's the fourth national event and the first in-person one since the pandemic. Here's Annette Francis. They've made the trek from First Nations across the country. Over 300 participants have come together to listen and ask questions about land protection. Isaac Lachapelle Gill from the Odenac First Nation in Quebec has been a land guardian for just six months. He's eager to learn what he can and encourages other youth to join the cause. So I'm trying to, you know, claim claim the land as our own as it used to be and protect it as we used to do thousands of thousands of years ago and just take back this role that we kind of lost on the way. There's more than 120 First Nations guardian programs operating in Canada. Marie-Philippe Menard says it's a growing movement. She's a coordinator for a youth program in her Innu community of New Tashiquan on the northern coast of the St. Lawrence. Menard says there are 12 Innu communities that applied for the program. It teaches youth environmental practices to protect the land and stay aware of their surroundings. They engage their community and uh, they also uh, go directly on the land, see if there's uh, oil spill or they are the eyes and the hear and the, the hear of the, the territory. Iris Catholic says she was born a land guardian. She grew up on the land in her Dene territory. Catholic is a manager for a newly established Indigenous protected area. She's hoping to inspire other guardian programs to protect their own territories. For a long time, Canada and has been in charge of what happens within all of our Indigenous protected areas. Now, Indigenous peoples from all across Canada have a voice. And, you know, if, if anything, Thai Dene Dene is, is uh, where I work, where I live, where I'm from. Um, it shows the world that you can have an equal footing with, with, you know, with the governments that be. According to Catholic, the Land Guardian program is a step in the right direction for the environment and reconciliation. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. 
All right, we have to pause our program briefly, but still to come, fires continue to rage as one organization trains up staff to fight them. There's enough reports that say it's emergency management's in a pretty bad place, so. Welcome back to APTN National News. A Métis settlement in Alberta has lost dozens of homes and other property after a wildfire ripped through the East Prairie Métis settlement. Hundreds were forced to evacuate last week. Dave Lamouche is the president of the Métis Settlements General Council and he joins us from Edmonton. Dave, thank you so much for joining us here today. First off, can you give us the latest on what the fire situation is there? In uh, East Prairie, right now, the, the fire has uh, died down. Uh, the, uh, the fire has moved uh, uh, away from the community. Uh, it's under control in that area. Um, and uh, people are, uh, like, there's still areas where the fire is smoldering, so they haven't been able to go back into the community yet. So uh, there is no electricity in the community, so there's, uh, I mean, a lot of the uh, houses have uh, uh, been out of power since last Friday. So the meat is, uh, I think they were taking meat out of the fridges and, you know, uh, starting to spoil and stuff, so. Well, and Dave, what type of damage has the East Prairie Métis settlement suffered from the fire? The, the biggest damage is the loss of uh, uh, houses where the members were, or families were living. Um, 29 of those homes uh, burned and uh, six, 14 to 16 uh, of those houses, people were living in them, like, uh, or families were living in them. And I think uh, some of them uh, were, uh, uh, were vacated uh, where people had moved to either the city or somewhere else to for work and education so they were sitting empty and uh, there was a few that were uh, older houses which uh, but all together um, uh, like i said i think 29 homes um, and over 40 structures including um, sheds and garages and barns and things like that that uh, they have lost as well well, so. that's uh, obviously very dis uh, disappointing to hear that, but uh, what can you tell us about the fire response? We've seen local firefighters battle the blaze, but some have criticized the provincial response. I think that's a common theme uh, everywhere in Alberta. I think the, uh, the lack of, uh, uh, of support, and uh, I think one of the things is sometimes it's uh, setting the priorities where of the resources that you have, where, you, where do you deploy the people? And uh, in East Prairie's case, uh, there was uh, some help uh, initially. And when the fire got a little uh, larger, uh, I think uh, there was uh, SRD and uh, the local uh, uh, fire departments backed off. And I think uh, in that case, some of the locals continued to fight fire on their own. Uh, There's some video that they had put out where they um, had their own cat running and you know their own uh, water truck they were using uh, to put out the fires making fire guards around the houses so uh, they did a, a bang up job by saving a few more than uh, you know than what, that, what, what would have happened. Well finally here Dave what happens next when can people head home and, and what happens for those without homes to return to? Well, that's the uh, $64,000 question, right? It's uh, uh, where do they go now? That's the real question. Uh, right now, they're uh, staying in high prairie in hotels. Um, you know, the, the people's uh, homes that were saved, the, once the power comes on, and um, there's about 15 kilometers of uh, power, power line that is down. So to get that uh, place powered up again, it's gonna take some time. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, that's for people that, that still have their dwellings there. Now the people that have no homes, where do they go? And I think that's where we need to uh, work with the, with the province of Alberta and uh, other, uh, um, you know, um, organizations to, to try and make a, a way or a place for them to, 
you know, uh, to go back to. Uh, these people lost everything. Like, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, photos I sent to you guys and videos, you'll see um, just a devastation. Uh, and it's not just losing a house, it's losing your livelihood. It's losing, uh, you know, memorabilia. It's, you know, hunting uh, equipment, um, you know, like quads and things that you have gathered over 20, 30 years and just decimated. Uh, just, uh, it's crazy, it's very emotional uh, state for a lot of those people, so. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us and giving us an update on uh, what's going on over there. We're certainly wishing you and, and everyone affected by the fire nothing but the best. Thank you. NDP MP for Edmonton Centre Blake Desjardins pressed the Prime Minister on Alberta's fire situation during question period today as Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu revealed that at least 150 structures have been lost and more than 4,000 people evacuated from Indigenous communities in that province. They don't know when they'll go home or what they'll go home to. Métis settlements and First Nations communities are hit worst of all. The federal government has a responsibility to ensure that the safety of Indigenous evacuees and provide them with the basics like water, food and shelter. What does this Prime Minister have to say to the thousands of Albertans who are, as we speak, without basic necessities right now? My message to Albertans, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, uh, is the same as our message to all Canadians who face terrible extreme weather events over the past years. We will be there for them. We will continue to work uh, with the provincial government. I spoke to Premier Smith just on Monday to assure that we were going to be there uh, with CAF supports, with resources, with whatever was needed. Now, some of the evacuees are returning home, but there are currently a dozen First Nations still affected by the fires. Well, with wildfire season underway, a nonprofit emergency services organization in British Columbia says they are equipped to protect indigenous communities across the province. Every year, the First Nations Emergency Services Society, or FINESS, trains nearly 2,000 First Nations people for various roles in fire safety. In this video from a 2022 crews from across the province competed in the Indigenous of Firefighters competition. The next competition is set for June. From training to providing equipment, Finesse specializes in helping Indigenous communities overcome any barriers that prevent them from accessing emergency services. Brendan Mercer says Finesse works with over 200 communities. Uh, well over 1,500 different certificates have been printed out for band members in the last little while. If another community needs resources in the middle of a wildfire season, well, then we know who to call from an adjacent community. Yeah, just really, really trying to improve emergency management for Indigenous people, because again, it's just so fragmented in BC and, and across Canada, too, to be honest. There's enough reports that say it's emergency management's in a pretty bad place, so... All right, we have to step aside one final time here on the news. Photo of the day and weather are next. Plus, superstar Shania Twain makes a mom and daughter's night at a recent concert. But the last thing I think we expected out of like a sold out show was for her to actually get a chance to meet her. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Our viewer Clarence Jones is in Chile and took the time to send in this photo of a volcanic mountain that is found in the traditional territory of the Mapuche people. Thanks so much for that, Clarence. You can share your photo with us by sending it to share at aptn.ca and it might be featured as our next photo of the day. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. We start on the east coast at 10 degrees in St. John's and 22 in Halifax. 12 degrees in clear in Happy Valley Goose Bay and 10 in Cushwack. Clear in 23 in Quebec City and 25 in Montreal. 24 degrees in Toronto and 23 in North Bay. Some rain at 16 in Wawa and rain at 21 in Thunder Bay. Mix of sun cloud and 11 in Churchill and clear in 20 in Puckatawagan. Clear in 14 in Barron's River and 24 degrees in Winnipeg. 19 degrees in Swift Current and 24 in Saskatoon. 
clear in 21 in Buffalo Narrows and clear in 18 in Stony Rapids. As we make our way west, clear in 17 in Fort Chippewan and 23 in rain in Peace River. Rain in 20 in Edmonton and rain in 19 in Calgary. Mix of sun and cloud and 21 in Campbell River and 20 in Bella Coola. 14 degrees in Prince Rupert and 24 in Fort Nelson. Clear in 15 in Dawson and 14 in Whitehorse. Clear in 23 degrees in Norman Wells and 18 in Yellowknife. 10 degrees in Fort McPherson and 5 in Colville Lake. Minus 4 in Cambridge Bay and 2 degrees in Chesterfield. Minus 5 in Resolute and 0 degrees in Iqaluit. Well, Indigenous art was the topic for In Focus this week. From painters, graphic designers, and even tattoo artists, we dug into the importance of Indigenous representation in the world of art. Visibility is really important, right? We need to see ourselves, especially like in this country in particular, where there is a lot of like racism. <laughs> Let's mm -hmm. be real. Like there's still, it's still prevalent and stuff like that. And we need to see different versions of ourselves, I suppose, or like, you know, rather than what like we've been told, because like, I don't know, growing up, like being indigenous wasn't cool at that time. <laughs> being indigenous wasn't like something that you could be loud and proud about. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, like I think it's very important for us to kind of like have our voices be heard. You get to learn a lot of stories. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a people person and I, I hear everybody's stories and the stories are the best, you know, and uh, you're just meeting the people. And I think my happy place is, is uh, making marks on canvas or stone or what have you, you know, and, and uh, just being in, in that zone to produce something that, whether, you know, it's, it's a lithograph or a painting. A baby Shania Twain fan from the Yukon was invited to come on over to the stage at a recent concert. She's so scared, but that's okay, I believe she is a new generation. 18-month-old Sophia per Perrin and uh, mom Jennifer got to meet the country diva up close during a performance in Edmonton on Friday. Sophia is a Trondequitchen citizen from Whitehorse. The little fan's parents says she's been dancing to Shania Twain since she was a year old. While Sophia's mom says the meeting didn't impress her much, at the time, it's a memory her family will cherish forever. But the last thing I think we expected mm -hmm. out of like a sold out uh, show was for her to actually get a chance to meet her. And it was definitely a lot for Sophia being on stage because every time she would like say something or whatever then everyone would scream and clap so it was kind of overwhelming for her um yeah it was i think she'll always <laughs> always remember it it was yeah something really cool That's such a cute story and a great way to wrap our show tonight. If you missed anything from our show tonight, our website, aptnews.ca, has you covered. For all of us here, thank you so much for joining us. Miigwech, Kinnanaskwetan, and have a great night.